my name is Mary Bielski, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. We'll be uh, doing a keynote tonight, and I'm excited to talk about this kind of uh, important and very controversial subject. Um, and so I'm going to dive right in as we talk about it, because we're going to break this open. As you see, this room is packed for a reason. Amen? That um, as, I, as I begin today, um, we're going to be talking about some challenging subjects and a, and a subject that I want to embrace and come with love. I have a friend of mine, um, how many of you have heard of Jason Everett? Yeah. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine, and he was sharing with me this story recently that uh, he was speaking in front of a number of, of high school kids at a high school, <laughs> hence high school kids, and he was sharing, he saw another speaker, and this speaker came out, and the first thing the speaker did is said, I want to play a game with you, a trivia game, and they're like, ooh, trivia games. And so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read or sing to you off some, some lyrics, and you can try to tell me what song it is. So this speaker started off, and he started off with this, like, raunchy kind of hip-hop song, right? And within two seconds, you know, like, the crowd was like, what? And they all, like, stood up, and they knew all the words, right? And he's like, hmm, well done, okay? And then the teachers are a little bit nervous. So then the guy did it again. He picked up another song from the radio, and he throws out the words and the lyrics, and within two seconds, all the kids stand up, and they know the words. They're, like, bopping. And the, the teachers are getting more nervous, Right? Because they're like, okay, where is this guy going? He does this three times with like nasty, raunchy songs. And every single time the youth know the words, they stand up, they know the artists, and everyone's in. And he goes, okay, let's try, let's try this one. And he switched to a scripture. And he said, see if you know this quote. A man will leave his mother and father and cling to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this hush comes over the room, like the whole room was silent, right? So they're all looking around. And so he tells a story that one kid, like, he's like, who can tell me who said that? And they're like, mm. And so one kid raises his hand, and he's like, mm, Buddha? You know, did Buddha say that? And they're like, no, not Buddha. You know, good try. And so someone else raises their hand, and they're like, Muhammad Ali? You know, like, mm, nah, I think he meant Muhammad, like the, the founder of Islam. No not close, close, and eventually, like, this, like, this kid in the back's like, mm, God, he's like, okay, good, God, and so they kind of came to the conclusion, as we start off today, like, I think this is a great example that a lot of us know a, a, a lot, a great about of what, what our culture is saying about this controversial topic, about this topic that's important to us, but a lot of us don't know really what the church is saying. Or maybe we don't really understand what the church is saying or why the church is saying. You know, if Pope Francis said, like, aren't, who are we to judge? Like, so what do we believe with those who experience same-sex attraction? Like, is it a good thing? What do I do when I have friends who experience this in my life? And what do I do if I experience these desires? Where do I fit within the church? So as I start off today, this is probably the most important thing, this next statement that I'm going to say as we start off this workshop the most important thing that I want to say, and I want you to listen to this statement. I am not here to talk about a controversial issue. I'm here to talk about people. People that we love. People that we care about. People in our families, friends, in our youth group, in our sports team, that maybe experience same-sex same -sex attraction that have these desires, maybe they even identify themselves as gay, lesbian, bisexual, bisexual, and we love these people, amen? We love these people. So I want to say it again, and I want to say it for Jesus, with as much reverence and honor for this topic, I'm not here to talk about a, a, a controversial topic. I'm here to talk about people. And in the center of that is how do we come to the love Hear my language, hear my tone. The love of Jesus Christ and the truth of our church. They come both. That's what I want to talk about today. Right? That's what I want to wrestle with, with you um, today. And so I want to just start off by saying this. If you are in this room and, and hear this and you experience same-sex attraction, first and foremost, you are loved and you are welcome in our church. Like, this is your home. We love you. I love you. And, 
And this has got to be the message that we talk about. This has got to be the tone that we, you are loved and you are welcome within our church. Right? And I think right now um, w- within our culture, and I'm going to, as, as we start off and just a, just a quick, like, one, two, three, on, I kind of jumped to the topic. We're going to be passing out pieces of paper. And so as I go, I, I want to encourage you, because this is like, I feel like we're at, like, at my house, and I'm like your big sister. And I want to encourage you, like, this is a safe place where we can ask questions, that we can ask questions we wrestle with. We're going to have people walking up and down to collect those pieces of paper. So as we go, um, we're going to have hopefully some time at the end to kind of jump into some of those questions. And, and hopefully more time throughout the weekend. I'm going to put up a slide with my information, um, hopefully. And it will have my, y'all, Instagram. You can find me anywhere, Twitter. Um, I'm not going to be Instagramming pictures back. <laughs> but uh, but um, emails. I want to say every email that I've gotten from all my Superville conferences, be patient with me and getting back to you because I, I do this full time and travel around the country. And so getting back to all y'all is taking me some time. So just look. And I'm hopefully going to be sending out some blogs that will have kind of a, uh, all the information that I've gotten because I see some themes without some of the questions that I've received already from the other conferences. And so I want to walk with you in that because I get the struggle. I understand. I'm in it with you. Right? I'm in it with you. And particularly the importance of it right now, the importance right now, and I want to just pause as we think about those in Orlando. Can, can, would you pray with me? This happened about a month ago with the shooting. Let's just pray really quick. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we begin. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you. And as we begin today, as we talk about those uh, in our lives that we love and we cherish, I lift up every family, um, every member, every person who was um, injured in that, in that holocaust, in that shooting. I lift up the family members. I lift up the community, Lord, that we still are praying. You have not forgotten. Lord, I lift up um, the abuser. I ask for healing for him, forgiveness and mercy, even in this time, um, that they would come to know and he would come to know uh, your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Also, I think it's important to talk about um, what's going on. It's kind of crazy right now. There's a lot of things happening on television, things that are going on that that we need to be aware of. And I want to just speak to that as I start. I was nervous as I started off this workshop because the Orlando event happened right like the week before I was doing my first Steubenville workshop. And I want to be clear, that is evil. It is not of the Lord. And I want to be clear right now that there are people in our culture who will hate. Amen? There are people that hate, but hear me on this. This is not the church. It is not, it is not the church. And it is not who we are today as we talk in this workshop about our approach to this topic, that we have got to be the center and the face of love itself. Right? Because I think right now what's, ha- what's happening as we enter in is the culture is giving a lot of sound bites. We're hearing a lot of sound bites about what we believe at the church, and I want to just speak to that from the spawn of hell because it is not true, right? The culture is saying two things. If you experience same-sex attraction, right, first of all, this is who you are. This is your identity at the core. You must act out on it or you're suppressing or hurting yourself, right? And so you basically have two choices. This is what the, the world is telling us. One choice is that we can hide in a closet, and it's called a gay shame, and you kind of hide away and you repress and it's like, wah, wah, I don't want to be in a, who wants to live in a closet? And, and most people that experience these desires don't want them or they, they, they're confused by them and all these things, they, they didn't choose them. So that's not a good option. And so the other option, the only other option the world presents to us is then, then you got to live it out. Then you got to just go out and experience and kind of indulge. So it's like gay shame or gay indulgence, gay pride, and there's nothing in between. And what the church is speaking to is there's, there's another option. That's about redemption. It's about freedom. It's about walking in the way that God's called you to walk. That's about love and life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because this whole, like, slander of the church, like, because if you don't believe that you have to live it out, then you're a hater and a bigot. Right? Don't you experience that? If, if, you, if you don't believe that this is the way, if you feel these emotions, I have a lot of attractions and feelings in my life that I don't live out. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But that is, that is not what, we have to be clear in what our church is saying. And I think that sound bite by the church, by, excuse me, by the culture, needs to be spoken to and just cut off. That is not what we believe. 
And, I, and I'll give you an example of that. I was, um, I was doing, I do a lot of street ministry. I love street ministry. Uh, our Pope is challenging us and asking us to go out and get out in the streets. I live in New Orleans, so it's people that have tattoos and like gauges and dreadlocks, and I love it. Like, I'll, that was about people, right? And so I'm like, yes. So I love going out. And so we do street ministry as Catholics. And so we do this thing called Night Fever. And so we'll go out in the streets of New Orleans, which is crazy. It's a very crazy city. And um, in the night, we walk around with lanterns. It's kind of cool because we're just like walking around like creepy people, but we're for Jesus. And we walk around with these lanterns. And we'll go up. And people are kind of wasted because in New Orleans, people are drinking and there's Bourbon Street. And so we're, we're talking to just homeless people, wasted people. Like, we're just here to preach Jesus. It's awesome. And so this, this couple walks up, and these two gentlemen, and I didn't know they were a couple, but we walk up, and the only way we evangelize is we bring a ca candle to them, and we say, do you want to come into the church? And y'all, the church is beautiful. We have the Eucharist exposed. We have contempt. We, like, zap them with glory and beauty. Like, they don't even know. We're like, come into the church. You don't know, because Jesus is going to zap you, you know? And all we do is we welcome them in and just say, come into the church, and there's light. We, they light candles all in the front of the church, and people walk in, and they just give them a moment of prayer. God just explodes, right? Just this beautiful night. And so we walk around with lanterns, and we just talk to people on the street. And there was this couple, and I said, um, it's like, hey, man, how you doing? Like, kind of weird. But do you want to go, like, we, we, the, the chapel's open, the church is open, it's beautiful cathedral, would you like to light a candle? And he's like, no, no. He's like, no, no thanks. I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, um, he's like, yeah, I'm a recovering Catholic. And I was like, oh, okay, what does that mean? And he's like, yeah, I used to be Catholic, and by the way, they don't want me. And I said, why, why would we not want you? And he said, I, um, I'm gay. Hello. You know, and he had, like, his partner with him. And I'm like, oh, no, man, we, we, totally, we totally want you. We started talking. We had this beautiful conversation and started talking about God. And so in this, this whole time of me wanting to know his story, I said, why, like, he, he and his, his partner were like, I'm like, well, please, just come in. It's really beautiful. He walks in the church, and I, I kind of lose sight of him. And I walk over. I'm talking to other people. And this night happens. It's so beautiful. So he comes out. And I see him from the corner of my eyes, and I'm talking to some other people, and I stop, and I run up, and I'm like, hey, how you doing, man? Like, how was your prayer time? And he was, he was struck because I remembered him. And it was like, just, my, just by me loving him. And as we were talking, he got all teary-eyed. And tears just started coming out of his face. He said, I have not been in a church since I was a young boy. And he starts, he starts getting moved by the love that I was just loving on him, just telling him the beauty, the goodness of who he was. I had my friends come in, we all laid hands on him, we were praying, they were crying, and we were like a love fest. And at the end of the conversation, this man said, you're Catholic, question mark? Like, this is the face of the Catholic Church, and I was like, oh, huh, watch out. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Like, this is the face, that the sound bites, right, is that not loud? That is the face of the church, where our Pope right now is saying, go out in the streets and preach the good news. And do you know what my primary message was? Do you know why I think that was so moving for him? My first message was not to talk about his sin, was not talking about his weakness, because we're all here as sinners, but to talk to him about the truth of his identity. That more than his attractions or his sexuality or all these other things that are in his heart, the truth of who he is is that he is a beloved son of God. Loved, anointed, called to greatness, like all of us, right? But I think the second thing that surprised him, and I think this is why he said you're Catholic, right? Is because we hear a lot of those sound bites. And that's why our voice here in this workshop has to be louder than our culture. We have to hold on to that love message, and I'm going to talk about truth as well. But listen to what our church says. It says this. This is from the U.S. Bishops Committee on Marriage and Family. It says, we stretch out our hands to our homosexual brothers and sisters. Though at times you may feel discouraged, hurt, or angry, do not walk away from your family, from your Christian community, from all those who love you. For it is in you that God's love is revealed, for you are always our children. Is this what you hear from our culture, right? This is, the, this is what our church's message, that we stand and love. And this is the beauty. As we start off today, that, I, want, I, want to, I want you to hear that first. That the message of the church first and primarily is that you are loved. But here's the other part of that truth, is that our, our previous pope, uh, Pope Benedict, said this. Love without truth is empty. And truth 
without love is cold. You all know that? When someone like kind of throws the truth at you and it's like, eh, it's cold, it doesn't mean anything. Or, or we can kind of have these other sentimental words, but they don't, they're not rooted in truth. The true Catholic stance is love, truth, together. It's the image of the cross, right? And sometimes in our desire to love, which is a good desire, right? We all want to love. And I think, like, that's a good thing. We can sometimes, and this is where I'm going to get into, I'm going to push in as a loving sister. Sometimes in our desire to love people, right? Because we don't want to be mean. Who wants to be mean? Do you all remember grade school? Yeah? Amen. Therapy, right? No one, I don't want to be mean. I still remember the kids that made fun of us. No one wants to be mean. But in our desire to love people, we sometimes putting being nice, right, as the highest good. And what we can do in our desire to not make anyone uncomfortable or to love them, which is a good desire, when we put that as the greatest good, right, when we don't understand that truth is rooted in love, right, it can get really confusing. And I want to play this video for you, and I want to ask for three volunteers to share your thoughts, because we're going to talk about this. this is an I'm going to treat you like young adults. And so play this video, and this video is um, taken from a campus, a college campus. It's called um, Crazy Things That College Students Say. And it's really to look at this question of truth, is that how far can we go? And um, watch this video, and we'll talk about it. There's been a lot of talk about identity lately. But how far does it go? And is it possible to be wrong? We went to the University of Washington. Are you aware of the debate happening in Washington State around um, the ability to access bathrooms, locker rooms, spas based on gender identity and gender expression? I, I think people should be able to have access to the facility. I think uh, bathrooms could and potentially should be gender neutral because there doesn't need to be a classification for differences. I think people definitely should have the ability to go into whichever locker room they want. Uh, I feel like at least public universities should do their best to accommodate for those who do not have a specific uh, gender identity. You know, whether you identify as male or female and whether your sex at birth is matching to that, you should be able to utilize the resources. So if I told you that I was a woman, what would your response be? Good for you. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you. I'll be like, what? <laughs> really? I don't have a problem with it. I'd ask you how you came to that conclusion. If I told you that I was Chinese, what would your response be? I mean, I might be a little surprised, but I would say, good for you. Like, yeah, be who you are. <laughs> I would maybe think you had some Chinese ancestor. I would ask you how you similarly came to that conclusion and why you came to that conclusion. Um, I would have a lot of questions just because on the outside, I would assume that you're a white man. If I told you that I was seven years old, what would your response be? Um, I wouldn't believe that immediately. Uh, <laughs> I probably wouldn't believe it, but I mean, I it wouldn't really bother me that much to go out of my way and tell you no, you're wrong. I'd just be like, oh, okay, he wants to say he's seven years old. If you feel seven at heart, then, <laughs> then so be it, yeah, good for you. <laughs> so if I wanted to enroll in a first grade class, do you think I should be allowed to? Probably not, I guess. I mean, unless you haven't completed first grade up to this point and for some reason need to do that now. If that's where you feel like mentally you should be, then I feel like there are communities that would accept you for that. I would say so long as you're not hindering society and you're not causing harm to other people, I feel like that should be an okay thing. If I told you I'm six feet, five inches, what would you say? That I would question. Why? <laughs> because you're not. <laughs> no, I don't think you're six five. If you truly believed you're six five, I don't think it's harmful. I think it's fine if you believe that. It doesn't matter to me if you think you're taller than you are. <laughs> so you'd be willing to tell me I'm wrong? I wouldn't tell you you're wrong. No, but I say that um, I don't think that you are. I feel like that's not my place as like another human to say someone is wrong or to draw lines or boundaries. No, I mean, I wouldn't just go like, oh, you're wrong, you're like, that's wrong to believe in it, because, I mean, again, it doesn't really bother me what you want to think about your height or anything. So, I can be a Chinese woman. You... <laughs> um, sure. 
but I can't be a six foot five Chinese woman. Yes. If you thoroughly debated me or explained why you felt that you were six foot five, uh, I feel like I would be very open to saying that you were six foot five or Chinese or a woman. It shouldn't be hard to tell a five nine white guy that he's not a six foot five Chinese woman. But clearly it is. Why? What does that say about our culture? And what does that say about our ability to answer the questions that actually are difficult? Okay, so uh, we're gonna just reverently, I would love to get three comments of people that just your, uh, come on up here, grab the mic and we'll just see it. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this and then I'll go into my other content. What's your name? Uh, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. What'd you think about the video? Um, when you first saw well, it? I thought it was kind of weird because, well, I thought that some of the people were being kind of stupid because um, they didn't really like say like any, obviously we have eyes, we can see if someone's six foot five or not, or um, I mean gender, because people wear clothes, that might be a bit harder to tell just by looking, but a lot of times we can tell if someone's Chinese or like six foot five, so as a human, I think we should be able to say that because we have the like mind and the eyes to look at it and awesome. see and judge it. Awesome, give them a round of applause. <laughs> okay, we'll get one more, you can come on up. Um, and when I say this, please notice, I know right now uh, transgender and the bathrooms is a, is a very sensitive subject. So when, I, when we're talking about this video, I'm not talking about those who experience confusion or have those, I'm talking, we're talking about this idea of truth and what happens, and, and, and when, our, when our truth, we're gonna talk about this in a Catholic perspective, when that conflicts against our reality, what are we called to do? We're gonna talk about that. It's a, there, it, there are people that struggle, but, but more so what happens when we fall down as a culture, because th she says something very interesting. Did she not say, I, I just don't feel like there are any boundaries. And what happens, it can lead us to some confusion, right? So that's all we're speaking to is, is just this kind of, this idea of truth. Who else had one? Yeah, come on down. Hi. What's your name? Hi, my name is Molly. Hi, Molly. Um, what do you think? Like, I just feel like nowadays, especially in our culture, like people are afraid to say what they really, the truth, they're afraid of offend, always offending someone, so people are sugarcoating things, and they just don't want to actually speak their mind when that's how we dull as a culture, so I think we should be able to have intellectual conversations and debates in order, if you do have, like, a, dis not a, sorry, if you have, like, a disagreement, and so I feel like even college kids, I know we're high school kids, but, like, we should be able to have conversations if we do have a disagreement. And I feel like we don't, and it's really dulling our world, and it's pissing me off, honestly. <laughs> okay. That's honest. I love it. I love her honesty. One more. Come on up. I, and I think that we're having, we're really going to be confronting, I think, specifically, oh, come on. We got one from the back. Oh, you want to you say something as well? Oh, okay. I already called him up, so let me, um, and we'll make it quick because I got I only have a short workshop. But go ahead. Okay. So I just think like, if society says you are whoever you identify are, then I identify as the president of the United States. So you all have to respect that. That means I can make laws. If I identify as a fruit roll up, you all have to respect that. Okay. This is really serious. So I just think that society is like flawed because we have all these rules, but th there's so many loopholes. Like I. If I identified as a seven-year-old girl and robbed a bank, you couldn't put me in prison. So that's just how it is. So. Right. One more. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm the I'm from the older generation. I mean, 65. But anyway, it's it's just that it amazes me how our society gets so blinded, and then. We get to the point where we don't want to offend anybody and not tell the truth of how we really feel. So God help us all. And that transgender for me, it bothers me. But if, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't agree with it. Okay, awesome. I mean, as far as bathrooms go. Okay. Yeah, bathrooms is a different. So we, we can have questions at the end. Awesome. Give a round of applause. So now, um, so as you can tell, even in the comments, there is a lot of emotion, right? And equally, those, I want to just be super sensitive, right? Because the, for those of us who don't experience these confusions, right? Um, 
it can be, uh, it can seem very light, but for those people that experience confusion, it's a real reality that I'm gonna speak into. Um, but my part in beginning, because again, we're, we're holding on to love, right people? We're holding on to compassion, but equally we have to hold on to the reality in which we live in. And so when I speak about truth today, um, I just want to say that there is truth. A lot of times uh, we kind of say, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is your truth. Or whatever I was going to say. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. And, um, which is, which is an okay saying, but we actually believe that there's an objective truth, right? And there's a subjective truth. Subjective truth is just truth that I believe that's based on my opinion. And there's an objective truth that's, that's truth based on our reality, right? And so what do I mean by that? So whether or not you like Justin Bieber, God help us, or... Um, I'm kidding, I love Justin, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Or One Direction, that's a subjective truth, right? Like that's, that's really about your personal preference and what you enjoy. Um, but if I said to you, like, you know, and there are many examples of this, but if I said to you, um, I believe if I jumped off the top of a building and flapped my arms that I would fly, right? No matter how strongly I felt about that, if I jumped off that building, I would, I would kill myself, right? Like that's an objective truth, that there are truths beyond our experience. And what happens when we base everything on our experience, there can be a lot of confusion, especially when our experiences conflict against reality, okay? And we believe as Catholics that we can know truth, right? And that Christ came as the, the way, the truth, and the life. Now when I say truth, I'm not here, notice, I'm not here like this is the truth that Christ came to give you, and it's about freedom. It's a truth in which God came to set us free, to show us a way in which we're called to live and act. And for those of us who live in a reality that is broken, that is separated, that's all of us, right? And Christ still calls us into that redemption of his love and a way, and a way to walk, okay? And what I love when we talk about, um, about this truth is that we have to begin with understanding the truth of all, even how God designed it, this whole understanding of natural law, that there's actually like the logos, God um, in his infinite knowledge, right, created the world in some sort of order. There's a way in which life moves and has its being, right? And I don't know if you've ever seen like a mountain or a skyscraper or something that just moves you or, or um, some kind of nature that you just see the glory of God, that there are, there's an order and how things are done. Even science points to that. There are laws. There's a meaning in our reality, right? And we believe as Catholics that we can come to know that meaning, one through grace and revelation, but even in our natural disposition, right, because we're made in his image. And so we can know some of those truths, right? I mean, I, I just recently saw this National Geographic thing with, like, um, with a jellyfish, and it was like, boop, 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 and I watched it way too long. I mean, seriously, but I was, like, fascinated with a jellyfish. And it was like, it's amazing. Creation is amazing. The design of the world is amazing. And even more than that, when you go deeper into that root, we, made in God's image, are the most profound creation that can exist. Amen? And we have to understand as Catholics, who are we? What is our identity as we talk about this topic? Okay, I don't want to lose anyone as you, as, as you go stay with me on this as we talk about this. That there's a proper, what the word is anthropology. What do, what do I mean by anthropology? I mean um, how we are made as humans. So we understand that there's angels, right? Right? There's spirits. There's a spiritual realm, right? And then there's animals. And then there's humans, that we are made as humans that are different than the angels, that we're not just spirit. We're different than the animals, that we're not just flesh with some spirit. We have a soul. Okay? And so to be human means that we're body and soul, which means that what we do with our body is important. It means how we view our bodies is important, that my body cannot be separated from who I am. A lot of times we base our identity in our emotions, right? We base our identity, like, listen to what Miley Cyrus said this. She said, who am I? I'm just equal to guys, right? She says, I'm just even. It has nothing to do with my body parts, right? Who I am has nothing to do with my outside or how I dress or how I look or my sexual identity. It's strictly how I feel. Notice how dangerous that is because if you think about your emotions, right? And you think about all your desires, when we base our identity on, on our emotions and just our desires, that means, right, if I'm, if I'm my desires, right? That means if I desire, right? To, if I see a billboard that has a sexual image on it and I desire and lust after it, then I'm an, who I am as an adulterer, right? Or if I see something else that I desire that's perverted or inverted, that means who I am. We all have a lot of different desires, right? If God could scan our brains, that would be a scary thing, right? 
Amen? And so we believe as Catholics that we have desires, and we have to honor those desires. I'm not here. Listen. I walk with many people that experience same-sex attraction. It's a real thing. And there's shame, and there's hurt. I'm here. I get that. Hear my reverence. We don't dismiss our desires, nor do we just blow it off and say, well, that's just, no, no, no. We need to honor our desires, but we go deeper into the truth. The church says that we are made male and female, and that our bodies are good. They speak to the reality and the truth about who I am, right? And that if I came up to um, you, and I, um, so our bodies are good, number one, we're body and soul. Our bodies are good, number two. Number three is that our bodies reveal our inmost person. So if I, what's your name again? What is it? Ryan, Ryan, and I came up to you and I just started punching you and just beating a lot about you and just doing stuff. And I started beating you. You would say stop. Would you say stop what? Stop hitting me, right? Great, perfect. Stop hitting me. Stop hitting me. You wouldn't say stop hitting my body. Do you hear the difference? We are our bodies. I'm not saying that you're just flesh. But our souls animate our bodies, who we are, our body and soul composite. That's very, very important as we talk about this issue, as we talk about what's going on in our culture. Who I am is expressed through my body. And that our God made us male and female that speaks to the profound truth of who God is. That by looking at my body, right, by looking at my body, now don't think about it, ladies and gentlemen, but think about it, you know, when you look in the mirror, don't think about it too long, and you see your naked body, you, you consider your body, by looking at your body, men, you know that you were made for another. You get that? Women, when you look at the fierce, beautiful creation that God has made you, you know by your body that you were made for another, right? There's a beauty in this complementarity in which the church holds truth that's written in the very nature of how we were made. There's a truth that we hold to, right? And the nature, right, this whole idea of the truth, right, there's a philosophical understanding that things have a nature to them, right? Right? There's a nature of how we were created, why we were created that points to reality. I said earlier that we are body and soul, but remember this, that we actually, like one day, you are forever going to... First of all, not one day. You are forever going to be with your bodies. Do you know that? We believe as Catholic in the redemption of our body. That one day, men, if you if we get to heaven, I'm going to assume everyone here is getting to heaven, you're going to be forever with your body. What? That's a good thing, I hope. Some of you are like, no. You know, ladies, mm-hmm. You're forever going to be. We believe even that Mary, the Blessed Mother, is body and soul in heaven. So this is why I'm talking so much about the body. Because our culture is totally separate. And you could do anything you want with your body. You can cut your body. You could do this. I'm not saying tattoos are bad. I love them. But I'm just saying. Um, right? But that, that we're, we're body and soul, it's important, right? And that our bodies speak to this nature. My third point is that there's a nature written in our bodies about sex. That sex has a nature. Mm, that's an interesting word. You said anthropology. You said nature. These are a lot of words I don't use. Right? So there's a philosophical understanding. If I was going to pull out some metaphysics and all these principles that I learned in my master's classes, I'm not going to do that. There's this understanding that things have a nature to them. Meaning they have an end. They have a, a reason why they exist. A purpose. So, for instance, if I stood up here and I said, what's the nature of fork? Okay? You would say, what's the purpose? Eat. Good. You're so smart. All y'all, right? Now, I can do many things with this fork, right? I can take the fork and I can scratch my back and, ooh, that feels kind of nice, right? Or I can take the fork and I can impale your leg, right? <laughs> this, this is blood everywhere, right? 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 So we can do, right? We can do a lot of things. I can do things with this fork, which, the way in which it was designed to eat, or I can use the fork in some ways. Now, using the fork um, in some ways may be moral, may be immoral, but certainly the, the very fact when I do that, it's, it's against the very nature of the thing, and it's an assault against how God created it. It's actually an assault not only against the fork, even though the fork has no feelings, about God himself. Let's talk about something else. An, an iPod, for instance. An iPod has many different, you might say, what's the nature of iPod? You would say a number of different things you can do with an iPod. You know, you can write emails. You can um, go on Instagram. You can, I don't know, a million different things, right? So we, we can do all these different things on an iPod. And if I said, let's say um, I asked you, 
is writing an evil email against the nature of an iPod? Or no, the answer is no. It's a, it's a sin, so hear me, there are things that we can do with our bodies or with our lives that are not sinful by nature, they're just sin. But there are other things that we can do that just is a sinful thing because it's against the very nature of what it is. So for instance, if I took that iPod or that computer and I used it as a Frisbee, or I used it as a plate to eat awesome nachos, right? It would be an assault against the very nature of how it was, what was in the, it was intended for. Let's go deeper one more. What about food? What's the nature of food? Heat, nourishment, right? To nourish our body, it also gives us pleasure, right? What if, now this is a sensitive topic, what if I took food and I separated them? Sensitive topic. We all know people that maybe want food for the pleasure because I love brisket and I love Chick-fil-A, tacos, right? But we, and so we use this item, right? But we don't want, so I want the pleasure of the food, but I don't want the calories. And so sensitive subject, and I throw up the food. Would that be against the nature of the food? Yes, right? And if I came up to you as someone who is bulimic or struggling with that, would that be something that you would encourage to do? No, right? Because it's an assault, not only when we break the original design of how God created or intended things, there's an order in which God intended. When we do that, right, it hurts ourselves, it hurts society, there's an order. There's a way in which God designed us to be fruitful in our lives, right? And there's, a, there's actually a nature to sex. Now, like, for instance, if I were an alien, and I went down and I was like, what is the nature of sex? This is crazy. Like, they're doing things and I want to look. That's a weird idea. <laughs> okay, don't think of an alien looking. You're all weirded out now. It's a creepy alien. It's about fall the, before the fall alien, okay? So it's pure hearted. I'm just going to look, right? So a creepy alien looks in the window, wants to see, <laughs> don't think about it, and wants to, be, <laughs> and wants to know what is, the, what is the nature of sex by looking at sex because what a man's body, right, a woman's body, this whole design points to a reality, a truth. This is the nature of sex, sex and the church says this, has two, has two parts to its nature. One, it's procreative. It's the only way that we can reproduce, right? Number two, it's unitive, right? In the marital act, the two become one flesh. And there's a truth that actually speaks to this um, in, a, in a, a theological point, but I'm going to go into that later if I have time, right? So it's procreative and unitive. And so what the church says is this. The church is not against those who experience same-sex attraction. The church stands true to the design of how God intended us. That means that every act with our body, including the, the church is, is true even against pornography, even against masturbation, even against sex outside of marriage, even against contraception, because it breaks the way in which God designed sexuality and the purpose of its beautiful fruit in its life. It's not picking on those who experience same-sex attraction. Please hear me. It stands in the truth of why God made sex, that God made male and female from the very beginning, this beautiful love act that points to a mystery in heaven. And when we separate this, and we make it just about pleasure or about our emotions, and I'm saying this very sensitively, any orifice will do. who holds the truth in love. Now some of you are thinking, well that's freaking not fair. Right? I've been ministering for the last three weeks to people that experience same-sex attraction coming up to me in tears. Walked walk with a transgender girl. Weeping, crying out in the, in the hallway, ministering, loving. Let's talk seems freaking unfair. I get it. When I was in high school, y'all, like, I get this from a personal level. You know, when I was in high school, I really struggled with this topic. I almost left the church because of this topic. Because I wasn't formed. I didn't understand. I thought it was just mean. I had a friend in high school who questioned her sexuality, and I had a teacher who was a dear friend of mine who was a lesbian. My senior year, she came out to me and told me. 
And at the, in the same time my senior year, she ended up, after we graduated, having a sexual relationship with one of my friends who was also female, and it caused a lot of confusion. And I had desire in my heart. I remember being around my friend and being like, I really love her. And I remember this moment of actually questioning, like, am I gay? Like, I remember, like, the fear that entered into my heart as I walked into that classroom, and I pulled my friend aside, and I'm like, dude, I don't... I'm just having feelings, or what are these, and are they attractions, what's going on, am I, am I gay? And then my, luckily my, my teacher said, well, I, I can't tell you that answer, and praise God that she said that. Because I think what can happen in the confusion of adolescence is that every attraction becomes something sexualized. Meaning that we can think that if we have any attraction at all, it means like I'm gay or something else. And I wanted to speak to that to give a freedom in this room that we all have desires for intimacy, amen? We were created for intimacy and love, right? And I think part of my issues in grade school is that I really struggled with my feminine identity. I was tall, I'm big at sports, like I'm athletic, I didn't feel like the other girls. And so I wanna speak to that, especially when we talk about this gender I um, identity. Our, our culture is saying that there's 58 billion I gender identities. It's not what the church teaches. But I wanna also say there is some truth in what the culture is saying. In that this, right, being a male and being a female isn't about whether you like pink or you play sports. I was not a girly girl. I didn't like pink. I loved sports. I was a tomboy. I'm fierce. I'm strong. I, I love football, but I am woman. And so, yeah. And I want to give freedom in the room. If you're a guy and you like musicals, right? <laughs> Bring it. I love that. If you're a guy and you don't fit the mold and you're not athletic and you don't grow, I mean, I don't, all that stuff's crap anyway. Ooh, sorry. All that stuff's not important anyway. Like, that's not who you are, right? That there's even a deeper reality that Christ reveals about your masculine identity. And women, if you like, like mountain bikes and you're tough and... But right, there was, I want to say that there was healing that needed to be done in my sexuality and my identity as woman, that the Lord has really brought me into my feminine heart. So there might be healing in some places that's part of our journey, right? But you are male and you are female, and there's a wide spectrum of how that is lived out in a beautiful way of how God created you. But I think what our culture does so much is it sexualizes everything, right? We can watch TV commercials and potato chips, and I went to... Um, I went to Lowe's recently and like shutters on a house, it said sexy shutters. And I'm like, mm, I don't really think shutters are sexy at all. Like, doesn't do it for me. You know, I'm like, no. But like how sexualized our entire culture is. And I think that can happen in our relationships. Like I had a, fr I just ministered to a girl last week in Atlanta. And she came up to me in confusion about her sexuality. What I found out in our discussion is that she wasn't gay. Like I was like, so you don't have any sexual desire. She's like, no, I just really like this person. And I like being around him. I'm like. It means you're human. <laughs> like, I have romances. I'm not gay. And, that, that, and, and I say that with compassion because if you have same-sex attraction, like, like, but I have women, right, that I love being around, that I'm excited, that there's actually, like, I just get excited and I want to, like, even, like, there's, a, there's an energy because I'm, we're made for intimacy. And men, you can have bromances where you're with your buddies and you're like, I'm not, but our, our culture, it, we don't know how to have intimacy. Hear me on this. You can actually live a life without sex. Hear me on this. Our culture is saying, I had someone come up to me and say, well, you, you're telling people that experience same-sex attraction that they can't have love. And that is not what we're saying. Sex does not equal love. It's an expression of many ways that we express love. And you know what a primary witness of that? Do we have any priests or sisters in the room? Could you stand up for us? Here. Awesome. Take a seat. Thank you. Let me ask you, Father, I'm just going to ask you, do you experience love in your life? Good, all of them, like, I do, I got that, right? Yes, 
And so what our church is saying, I, I want to just say that because that's the most common rhetoric that we hear is that you're saying that you can't. No, we're saying what it means for those who experience same-sex attraction, for those who have a number of ways that that presents, what it means is that it means the same thing for them as it means for me, is that we have to live a life of chastity. It means that we're called to orientate, or, orientate those attractions, lots of different attractions, into the right order of how God designed us. What I mean by chastity is not a no to sex. It's not abstinence. It means, like, yes, those who have same-sex attraction are called to live a life of chastity, meaning they're, they're called to not act out on those sexual desires. The church says, someone always, I had a question last um, time I did this. So wait, do people, does the church not like gay people? The church loves everyone. And if you experience, right, the church loves everyone. Oh, you can clap for that. That's fine. They're all like excited. Like, wow, we love people. We love people. This is great. But the church separates because we don't actually believe it's the identity and so the church separates to say, you can experience same-sex attraction. There's nothing, no, there's nothing sinful about that. It would be a disordered desire. Pause. What do I mean by disordered desire? A desire in which, it was, in, in which does not lead us to freedom and truth. Meaning, my desire to cheat, my desire for pornography. My, I, that's, not, that's not my desire. I don't know why I said that. But that's okay. I, I don't struggle with that. But that just, I just made a big confession. Um, my, my, des my desire to, to, to be the center of attention are disordered desires. They're not the intention of how I was created. I was created for love. And so we have many desires that are disordered. And so the church would say that those desires, like many desires, although are disordered, right, the person is good. What is sinful is acting out. And so people that experience same-sex attraction are called to a life of chastity just like all of us. Because let me just be honest. It's a struggle to love rightly. Amen. And I want to say this with sensitive, sensitivity, that those of us in this room that experience same-sex attraction, I know that there is, it seems as if, and it's true, I really believe there's a heavier burden. And listen to what our church says, and we're going to go to questions in a second. Because um, I think this is probably the most beautiful. This is the UCAT, which is the, the catechism for the youth. It says this. So what does this mean for those who experience same-sex attraction? We're going to bring some people on stage. The church believes that in, order, in the order of creation, man and woman are designed to need each other's complementary, complementary traits and to enter into mutual relationships so that to give life to children. This is why homosexual practices cannot be approved by the church. Christians owe all persons respect and love. However, regardless of their sexual orientation, peop, um, so people are, 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 let me say that again, people are, called to be respected and loved regardless of their, their sexual orientation because they're loved by God. There is no man on, on earth who has not been created from the union of man and woman, mother and father. Therefore, it is a painful, listen to the compassion of our church. I cried when I wrote my talk, this talk, because it's, when, I had my, when I had confusion in my heart, it was painful. People that experience, it's, there's a lot of shame and hurt. I'm not belittling that walk and that cross. And we cannot belittle it by throwing up a little slogan to say truth. We have to stand in love because it's a struggle. And listen to what the church says. Therefore, it is a painful experience for many homosexual oriented people that they do not feel erotically attracted to the opposite sex and necessarily miss out on the physical fruitfulness of union between man and woman according to the nature that God designed in, in natural creation. Nevertheless, and this is the like drum roll of Christ, God often leads souls to itself amongst unusual paths, a lack, a loss, or a wound, if accepted and affirmed, can become a springboard, right? A springboard for throwing themselves at the arms of God, the God who brings goodness out of everything, whose greatness can be discovered in redemption even more than creation. I walk with five people in my life that experience same-sex attraction. I have a deep compassion for this. And one, um, one is married. She still experiences same-sex attraction. And she's just like a lot of attractions. She's just aware of it. And, she, and, she, and she's married and she's fruitful. I have another friend who um, is, has, a, ha, has struggles with pornography of the, of the same gender, same-sex attraction, struggles. Um, and he lived out the lifestyle, led him into deep depression, a lot of hurt. 
A lot of it that he shares with his, is about his relationship with his father. I'm not here to diagnose where it comes from specifically, but there was a moment that he decided to live this life, that I'm just going to be single and seek to live for the Lord. He, he works at a soup kitchen. He, like, goes to daily mass. And he called me one day, and he said he was in the back of the chapel praying, and this woman walked in, and he said, Mary, I don't know what the Lord's doing, but I, like, felt this attraction to her. That the God was like literally redeeming his desires. Now I say that with compassion to say, does everyone that has same sex attraction, are they going to be healed by God? I'm not here to say that. I think that on this side of heaven, we're all going to carry crosses. St. Paul had a wound, right? He had a thorn in his side. And I have thorns that I have to carry. And I want to say with compassion that it's not an easy cross to carry. But I will say this. I believe that God's raising up saints. There will be saints in our generation who will stand to the truth of what Christ is calling them to in chastity because there's freedom and there's truth in the love of Jesus. And we stand here with our brothers and sisters holding hands, right? All people here that struggle with their sexual identity, who struggle with um, pornography, whatever your struggle is, we're all strugglers. Struggling with um, greed, struggling with our, like, our friendships, struggling with envy, struggling all those things because we're broken and in need of Jesus. We hold hands to each other, and this is what we do, right? We hold hands and we keep our eye on the Lord knowing that he is enough. He will quench our thirst. We will groan with St. Paul, all of us, as we wait for the final redemption. That's my journey, y'all. I cry in adoration all the time because living this life is not easy, but it's worth it.